last night. Is it working? Yes. Sometimes. Good. <laughs> Thank you, Clive, for the introduction. Apologies to everybody else and to Clive. Um, I've no idea how we get it from where it is until showing you a full screen projection. But as it is, you can see the slide, ignore the stuff around it that you aren't supposed to see. This is a little known story of the Holocaust, although it tells of the rescue of a large number of Jews from near certain death at the hands of the Nazis. One reason it is so little known is that the central figure was a Jew. Paradoxically, but it's right. A man named Miklos Kraus. His Hebrew name was Moshe. That was how he was known for the last, I don't know how many years of his life, and I called him Moshe. He's the Moshe named in the title of the lecture, so now you've got a clue. Something else we've got to get working. Just a moment. Can I try something on the computer? No, it's all right, don't worry. Not yet. Not responding. Ah, there it is. Good. We made it. Okay. That's Moshe. This is a photograph of him taken at the time with which we are concerned in the 1940s. I can't say when in the 1940s. I have to mention something at this point as an introductory point, and you must bear it in mind when viewing the pictures on the screen. In wartime Hungary, Hungary, especially after the Germans took control of it, possession of a camera was a criminal offence, and using a camera was a serious criminal offence that was met with condign punishment. The Germans and their allies did not want anyone to photograph their activities, especially those connected with the Jews, the ghettos, or the Holocaust. Their own troops took photographs, some of which survived, but no one else could do so in safety. And that is why there is so little photographic material around showing what was happening at this period in the area with which we are concerned. Back to Moshe Krauss. He is credited with having saved between 40,000 and 100,000 Jews. With the assistance of various people whom he recruited, Yet few have heard of him, and fewer still remember what they heard. Yad Vashem, the World Holocaust Remembrance Center in Jerusalem, opened its doors in 1953. It was dedicated to preserving the memory of those killed in the Holocaust, honoring Jews who fought against the Nazis, honoring non-Jews who helped Jews in time of need, and researching the subject of the Holocaust in particular and genocide in general, with the aim of preventing such events in the future. From its inception, the work of honouring non-Jews had a particular priority for those running Yad Vashem. And this is one of the aspects of Yad Vashem's work that is best known around the world. They set up a system for honouring those dubbed righteous among the nations, Chasude Umot HaOlam, namely those non-Jews who without any financial or evangelical motive helped to save individual Jews from genocide in the Shoah. You will have seen, I'm sure, pretty well everybody here, the trees planted in Yad Vashem to honor individuals that helped save Jews. On the other hand, individual Jews who risked their lives rescuing other Jews were ignored by Yad Vashem, which has only recently begun to publicize their efforts and Yad Vashem was not alone in this attitude. Why? I don't know, but that's what they did. The story of Miklos, of Miklos Moshe Kraus was known to literally thousands of Jews, but he received no official recognition during his lifetime. And it looks as though he was perfectly content that that should be, shown, that that should be so. On the other hand, Karl Lutz, a non-Jewish Swiss diplomat whom Moshe Krauss recruited to help carry his schemes into effect was honored by Yad Vashem as early as the 24th of March 1964 when his name was added to the list of righteous among the nations, the first Swiss national to be so honored and he planted a tree.
That was a year or two after a street in Haifa had been named after him. If you look him up in Wikipedia, you'll find him credited, you'll find him credited with having saved over 62,000 Jews, a number that may be too high, but more probably is too low. Wikipedia does not mention Moshe Krauss at all in that entry, even though Karl Lutz was just one of the tools used by Krauss. It credits Karl Lutz with the largest rescue operation of Jews of the Second World War, even though he was just the man who helped Krauss to carry his schemes into effect. And parenthetically, all sorts of people are supposed to have had the largest rescue op operation of Jews of the Second World War. Wallenberg springs to mind, Ralph Wallenberg. I found a video on YouTube of the red dedication of a lookout point in his memory near Tavelia, Tiberius. The speech is about him, no mention of Moshe Krauss. I'm not minimizing the part he played. Without him, many, if not most, of Krauss's schemes would have failed. But he is not, was not, and is not entitled to the sole credit. This is Karl Lutz. I believe this is a photograph taken around the time of the war. I can't be more accurate than that. Maybe from a passport or from some other, doc other official document. You can see if you look very closely, the top left hand corner, there is part of the impression of a stamp which suggests it may have been attached to an official document and detached from it the photograph. <coughs> this is a later more formal photograph of him. So now you have two of the names mentioned in the title of this lecture, Moshe and Karl. We will come to the third name, the Glass House, in a little while. Before we go any further, I need to tell you the history of Hungary, or at least the relevant bits of the history of Hungary, during World War II. Miklos Horthy, another Miklos, was a Hungarian admiral who became regent of Hungary in 1919. Regent is another for saying dictator or king. He had absolute power. And he ruled Hungary and was still running Hungary during much of World War II, during which that country was part of the axis led by Germany and Hitler, and later on Japan, and of course Italy was in there as well. Horthy was very anti-Semitic, but he was a fa and he was also a fascist. So he and Hitler and the Axis got on very well with each other. So much so that when the German army invaded Russia, a large contingent of soldiers from Hungary marched with him, with them. Oops. Thank you. There you see them. In case you don't recognise him, the one with the moustache on the right is Adolf Hitler. The one on the left is Miklos Horthy. During this period, there was already legislation in Hungary severely limiting the activities of Jews. The new laws barred them from practicing various professions and trades, very much like the Nazis' Nuremberg laws on which they were modeled. However, there was relatively little actual persecution, such as that practiced by the Germans. Early in 1944, his Prime Minister, yet another Miklos, Miklos Calais, began secretly to sound out the Allied powers about the possibility of Hungary abandoning the Axis and making a separate peace with the Allies. As was probably inevitable, the news of these negotiations leaked out. Hitler heard about them, and on March the 12th, 1944, he ordered Operation Margareta, the Nazi military occupation of Hungary. It was brilliantly planned and brilliantly executed. While Horthy was at a meeting with Hitler at the palace outside Strasbourg, Salzburg, from the 15th to the 18th of March, 1944. This meeting was arranged purely to ensure that the Hungarian armed forces would be left without orders for three days. Remember, Horthy was a dictator. Nobody else would order them into action. It achieved its objective. Units of the German army quietly entered Hungary and captured many critical facilities. 
all without a shot being fired. Jürgen, please. On March the 18th, Horty boarded his train home, totally unaware of what had happened over the preceding days. When he arrived in Budapest, he was greeted at the station by the German army officers, by German army officers, and found himself facing a fait accompli. He was told that Hungary could only reign sovereign and avoid becoming an occupied country under the rule of a Gauleiter if he agreed to remove the Prime Minister, Calais, and replace his government with a government that would fully cooperate with the Nazis. Horthy had no alternative to complying, and he did. I say no alternative. The Nazis actually kidnapped his son at one point to ensure that he fell in without instructions. Once the Germans had taken control, they set about organising the extermination of Hungary's Jews, many of whom, perhaps the majority, were in the capital, Budapest. As you might expect, the operation was overseen by Eichmann. Events then occurred which made all the difference. The first was the escape from Auschwitz of two heroic Slovakian Jews named Rudolf Berma and Alfred Wetzler. They made their way to the head of the Slovakian Jewish Council, a man named Oskar Krasniansky, and told him what was happening at Auschwitz. Chapter and verse, details and all. That was in April 1944, within weeks of the Germans' arrival and in and occupation of Hungary. Krasniansky translated their account and produced a 32-page document which became known as the Auschwitz Protocols. For the first time, there now existed a proper account containing accurate and detailed information about what was going on inside Auschwitz, including the methods and the dimensions of the extermination process. By that time, reported the document, 1.75 million people 1,750,000 had already been killed there and preparations were being made to receive and kill the Hungarian Jewish population amounting to well over 800,000 people. The extermination process in Hungary began in the outlying communities in mid-May 1944. By the end of May it was in full swing. In June it caught the Klausenberg 11 as a little side note. The Germans would arrive in a city, town or village, assemble the Jews and either shoot them somewhere nearby and bury them in a mass grave there or ship them off in trains to the death camps. In bigger centres of population, especially Budapest, the capital of Hungary, but also in city, cities elsewhere in Hungary, the Germans used the same system they'd successfully used in all the territories they conquered, with some local variations. First, they set up ghettos and crammed all the Jews they could find into overcrowded and totally inadequate accommodation within the walls of the ghettos, where starvation and disease took their toll. Finally, when their surviving victims were thoroughly weakened and demoralized, the Germans would collect non large numbers together, march them to the railway station, and ship them off to some death camp, usually Auschwitz, under the pretext that they were being sent for forced labour elsewhere. On arrival, most were immediately murdered and their bodies cremated. The Germans achieved a rate of 12,000 a day deported and killed in this way at the peak of this activity. 12,000 a day in Auschwitz alone. There seems no reason to doubt that if things had continued the way they were, the Jews of Hungary would have gone the way of those in Poland, over 90% would have died. In Poland the rate was 93%. Now, I want to turn back to Miklos, to Moshe Kraus, Zechat Sadik Libracha, I think I am entitled to say. You've already seen this photo, Arden. He was one of the heads of the Zionist movement in Hungary and directed the Palestine office in Budapest. As I hope I will show, he was a remarkable individual. 
<coughs> By the end of May 1944, with the extermination process in Hungary getting into full swing, he had a copy of the Auschwitz Protocols. He produced an abridged version and went on to produce his own report describing the destruction of the outlying Jewish communities in Hungary. This report was highly detailed, identifying the places where communities had already been sent to their deaths and even naming many individuals who had already been killed. Krauss then saw to it that copies of these two documents found their, found their way into the hands of the region, Horty, and all the important political figures in Hungary. More importantly, perhaps, because of his position, Moshe Krauss had acquaintances in the embassies in Hungary of many countries, including many neutral countries. In particular, he had contacts with people in the Swiss embassy of Budapest and was friendly with many of them, and he used these contacts to the full. The most important task at the outset was to ensure that the Swiss and other embassies and the international press, rather more difficult to achieve, had the two documents to which I already referred, the abridged Auschwitz Protocols and his own report on the slaughter in Hungary. As I say, copies went to as many embassies as possible, and at least one found its way to an international news agency, and suddenly, details of the Holocaust were in the international press. For my purposes, I'm concerned only with Switzerland. The reports created an instant and real stir. Prompted by the public, the Swiss public, the Swiss government put enormous pressure on Horthy to stop the murders in his country. Other countries and prominent personalities became involved. The Pope sent a letter of protest to Horthy. So did Franklin D. Roosevelt, President of the USA. So did Winston Churchill, Prime Minister of the United Kingdom. So did King Gustav V of Sweden. I must stress, these are just the ones I know about. There were almost certainly a lot more, but we don't know. The pressure on Horthy and the Hungarian government now became unbearable. To make it worse from Horthy's point of view, the letter from the United States included a military threat, and as a result, he halted the deportations. By that time, more than half of the Jewish population of Hungary had been wiped out, but the rest now had a chance of survival. I deliberately got ahead of myself turning the political aspects of the story we must go back in time to a few weeks after the Germans had started the deportations. I've already said this, but Krauss used to the full his contacts with the staff of the Swiss Embassy in Budapest. They, of course, were aware of the public feeling in their home country and were unstinting in their help. And that was a crucial factor in what followed. And so we come to Karl, Karl Lutz, whom I've already mentioned earlier, and with whom Moshe Krauss happened to be particularly friendly. This is a photo you've already seen. Karl Lutz had a checkered history. He was born to a Swiss couple on March the 30th, 1895, but he lost his mother when he was only 14. He earned a living doing manual labor. In 1913, he emigrated to the USA and there he worked his way through college. In 1920, he got a job at the Swiss Consular Corps in Washington, D.C., but he continued to study in his spare time at the George Washington University, from which he graduated with a bachelor's degree in 1924. He moved on to Swiss consulates in two cities in the U.S., until he was sent to serve as vice consul to the Swiss legation in Jaffa, in Mandate, Palestine, Jaffa. There in 1936, he witnessed through a window the lynching of an unarmed Jew by an Arab mob outside his home. 
That incident may, ha may explain his readiness to help, years later, when asked to do so by Moshe Kraus. There's no doubt that it made a great impression on him, and I suppose it would any to anybody. Two years later, in 1944, Moshe Kraus supplied him with copies of the abridged Auschwitz Protocol and of his own report, and successfully persuaded him of the need for humanitarian action to save some of Budapest's Jewish population, swelled as it was by outsiders who had fled to Hungary when it was still safe and elsewhere on the continent of Europe. Karl Lutz was convinced, and he set to work in full cooperation with Moshe Kraus. Within a few short months, in 1944, mostly between July and October, they achieved amazing results. October is relevant because in that month Horthy was deposed and the Arrow Cross took over. Most people have never heard of the Arrow Cross. The Arrow Cross was the Nazi equivalent of the SS or the SA more likely in Germany. They were the thugs who were the militia who were there to enforce Nazi will on the population. And of course now they were in their element. The Arrow Cross was the Hungarian Fascist Party modelled on the Nazi organisations that occurred when Hitler came to power and like the Nazis they were never happier than when tormenting and killing Jews. Within that period, from July to October 1944, Krauss, Lutz and many volunteers, you'll hear about them in a moment, did most of the rescue work I want to describe. Before they could really get going, they had to start the bureaucratic manipulations that were necessary to their success. Back to general matters. Over some hundreds of years, other countries in Europe and elsewhere had learned that Switzerland would not tolerate any mistreatment of its citizens and expected that they would be treated with the proverbial kid gloves. What was needed was the recognition by the Germans of some sort of documentation that would save individual Jews from persecution. The paperwork, paperwork aspect of things clearly could not be neglected. Many of the actions Krauss devised have been described as bureaucratic slate of hand. Let me recount the most spectacularly effective, which began with, begins with something apparently wholly unconnected with the problem. Before this, the British were issuing some, some immigration certificates entitling the holder, the bearer, to admission to Palestine, which was then under their control under the League of Nations mandate for Palestine. Such a certificate might seem of little value to a Jew in occupied Hungary, but it was in fact of incalculable value, as we will see. The British had issued 1,500 of these immigration certificates of Palestine for issue by those looking after their interests in Hungary. Those looking after their interests in Hungary were the Swiss Embassy. And that, of course, is where Karl Lutz was the Vice Consul, capital letters, the Vice Consul. In fact, he headed the department that looked after foreign interests, including British interests, the interests of states, countries that could not have their own embassy in Hungary because of the war. Moshe Krauss enlisted his aid, Karl Lutz's aid, in connection with these certificates, and Lutz achieved a key success right at the outset. The Germans recognised the validity of the certificates. It gets intricate, so try and stay with me. 1,500 people were then going to be entitled to a document that would keep them alive, <coughs> under the protection of the Swiss, who were looking after British interests. And they were almost scared of the Swiss. During the following months, undoubtedly, forgery was practiced on a massive scale by Moshe Krauss, who thought up the various schemes. Yiddish Yikop, we say, don't we? Karl Lutz, who wholeheartedly supported him, and anonymous volunteers 
mostly Jews, but also some anti-Nazi Hungarians who did much of the paperwork, and I will have some more to say about that shortly. They were hugely successful. <coughs> the first trick was to turn the 1500 certificates, which were intended to be used by 1500 individuals, into family certificates. By a stroke of the pen, a certificate now, instead of authorizing one person to enter Palestine, would authorize the holder to enter with all his family, which meant his wife and children, however many there might be. Now there'd be some people who'd be childless, and some people who only had a couple of kids, but some people might have eight or ten children. Everyone was included in a family certificate. So at a stroke of the pen, just let's take an average of three children per couple. The documents that were supposed to protect 1,500 people were instead protecting 7,800. That's five times. You get the idea. Afterwards, those 7,800 certificates were again transformed. They were transformed into 7,000. That was 7,800 individual certificates. And shortly afterwards, those 7,800 certificates were again transformed into 7,800 family certificates. And if you say the set, take the set multiplier 5, 5 times 7,800 is 40,000. And so 40,000 people had been brought under the protection of the Swiss Embassy by a lot of ink and pen and paper and a lot of devious thinking. That's where we get the figure of 40,000 for the minimum number of people who were rescued by Lutz under Moshe Krause's direction. Each step produced an increase in the number of people under the protection of the Swiss by virtue of the British certificates, and the total increase was massive. The consequence was that the opera operation organized and led by Moshe Krause now had 40,000 Jews, or at least the capacity for 40,000 Jews, to be protected by their possession of apparently valid certificates issued by the British and supported by the Swiss government and the Swiss Embassy, more importantly. <coughs> I'm getting ahead of myself again because I've skipped over some of the most important events in this operation. The Germans were trying to catch up very hard. They were trying to catch up with what had happened in relation to the British immigration certificates. Their problem was that they needed more than they were getting. They were needing more than, from, than the limited cooperation they were getting from the Swiss, but they didn't want to offend them. So they had to go tiptoeing around the problem. To hinder them, Krauss took great care to ensure that no group of Jews holding certificates exceeded 7,800. And the individual numbers of those in, the, in each group contained no duplicates. So there might be 10 people holding certificates numbered 1, 2, 3, but they would be in different parts of the city and different groups to make it difficult for anyone examining them to track down the fact that there were multiples. There are many gaps in the story at present, and I have no idea if we'll ever find out precisely what happened in relation to some of them. What we do know is that though the Germans didn't have formally, officially recognized the results of these manipulations, they were recognized by the International Red Cross and by the Swiss government, which meant that the Germans had to be very careful how they handled the holders of British immigration certificates. Krauss was making every possible effort to persuade the Germans to recognize the documents. He couldn't understand what had happened to let the Germans know what had been going on, and in particular, how so many people were now covered by the certificates. Years later, Krauss, much later on in his life, wrote a newspaper article in which he recounted how eventually he discovered that someone had told the Germans that the original certificates had applied only to individuals and not to families. He went in the article to say that the someone was, in his words, one of us, Dr. Kastner, 
which gives rise to a whole set, gave rise to a whole separate story. The story is complex. I don't know enough of the details to speak authoritatively about it. I do know that it was the subject of litigation later when the State of Israel had come into existence and had won its war for independence. I know also the litigation was replete with all sorts of political and other complications and that it was followed with bated breath by the press in Israel and to some extent abroad. I must get back to the story I want to tell. Once Moshe Krauss realised that the Germans were aware that something had gone on, that there had been apparently illegal steps in relation to the documents, he realised that urgent, must, urgent action must be taken to protect the document holders. Again, Karl Lutz was the key actor. The tools he used were called Schutzpassen, the plural of the German word Schutzpasser. I've seen the word Schutzbrief also used. Roughly translated, the word Schutzpasser means protective pass. Schutzbrief means much the same. They were official documents issued by the Swiss Embassy's Department of Foreign Interests. Each of the documents identified the holder as a Swiss subject awaiting repatriation, confirmed that the holder appeared in a collective Swiss passport, and stated that he ought to be treated as holding a valid Swiss passport. That meant that the Germans and their Hungarian allies could not take any action against them without offending the Swiss. I've already mentioned the attitude to the Swiss in Germany and in Europe and outside Germany. The point in the German case was their services as a conveniently local neutral power were extremely valuable to the German government. For the Schutzpassen to work, there had to be a collective Swiss passport, and there was. It soon contained a lot of names, eventually tens of thousands of them. But long before that, Krauss and Lutz found themselves facing an apparently insoluble problem. The Swiss legation in Budapest was quite a small building. It simply could not accommodate the number of people required to do the clerical work that was required by all these machinations. I spoke to four documents, there were forged stamps, there were all sorts of steps being taken. The documents had to be properly completed, had to look properly official, and had to bear all the stamps that were necessary. That took a lot of people, and there was no room in the Swiss Embassy, quite a small building. And this is the point at which I want to tell you about the glass house. The third name in the title of this talk, in Budapest, there was a large building. Uh oh, what happened there? There you are. In Budapest, there was a large building that, before the war, had housed a glass factory. The survivors called it the Glass House. In Idrit, it's now called Bet Hazuhupit, which means the same thing. There it is. The photograph, I think, must have been taken shortly after World War II ended, because it certainly looks like the building did during the war. With one exception, there was a Swiss flag, but I'll tell you about that in a moment. If any of you know Budapest, familiar with it, it's at 29 Badas Street, not far from the Hungarian Parliament and from St. Stephen's Basilica. That should give you an idea of the area if you're familiar with Budapest. It was owned by a Jew called Arthur Weiss, but under the anti-Semitic measures introduced by the haughty government, he'd been prevented from continuing to run the factory, which consequently ceased to operate. The building was therefore empty. Sorry, I'm trying not to turn over two pages. There you are. It isn't clear, at least to me, who approached who. Certainly Arthur Weiss agreed, and maybe he offered to allow the factory to be used to accommodate Jews. At Moshe Krauss's suggestion, Karl Lutz granted the building extraterritorial status under the auspices of Switzerland. Putting that into simpler language, he turned the factory legally into Swiss territory under the control of the Swiss government through its embassy. In other words, there was now a piece of Switzerland in that factory, the whole of that factory, being run by the Swiss Embassy. 
those, another, at, at that stage, a Swiss flag was put up, flying from a post that was mounted here, pointing up at an angle. And there was a Swiss flag over the entrance. That actually is the, if I'm not mistaken, is the entrance. We'll see some more pictures of the building in a moment. The building was soon mobbed by Jews seeking admission to safety. That's the sort of mob that had to be contended with. They were beautifully behaved. That's this in the entrance, I think. In the entrance is over there, if I'm not mistaken. You'll be able to see better than I can. I'm looking at everything from a funny angle. And even after things were much better, even after things were much better under, wrong way, sorry, much better under control, there would form an orderly queue, such as you see there, uh, with the small canopy above the entrance and the Swiss flag, the star, just out of the picture in, above. Within a very short time, there were over 3,000 Jews men, women and children crammed inside the former glass factory. They were there for some months while their documents were produced. But because they were safe, they were a low priority in terms of documentation. It was impossibly crowded, but nobody complained. They were safe. Living conditions within were difficult in many respects, as you can probably imagine. Sleeping arrangements gave rise to problems. To give just one example of the imaginative solutions that Krauss thought up, because it had handled large plates of glass, there were great big tables inside the premises in the workrooms. Once the building was in full use, these were available. And once it was in full use, there would be up to 20 people sleeping on top of a table, with another 20 sleeping underneath. It was remarkable how they squeezed everybody in. The question everybody thinks of, but don't ask, there were some toilets, but there were far too few for the population of the building. The resourceful Krauss seems to have found some sort of solution for every problem. For example, once the Schutzpassen had been issued, the Red Cross provided food and basic supplies for these stranded Swiss citizens. In addition to being a place of refuge, the glass house became a bureaucratic centre where all kinds of documents were produced in what had formerly been the offices of Arthur Weiss's business. And this is where the volunteers that I mentioned worked, producing the papers that were of such value. Most of them were Jews, most of them living in the glass house, although there may have been some Hungarian anti-fascist volunteers as well. There probably were, actually. Most of the documents were forged, <coughs> as I've already said. But the British didn't know that their documents were being manipulated, as I've described, and no one in the scheme was going to tell them. And Lutz and the embassy staff, representing the Swiss government, were quite content for their documents such as Schutzpassen, to be produced there en masse, forged in there, by the band of volunteers recruited by the indefatigable Krauss. So successful were his efforts that of the 3,000, more than 3,000 occupants of the glass house, only six people died during the war. The Germans just couldn't get their hands on them, and if they, had, if they got hold of them, had to release them. The success of the glass house then resulted in other similar efforts. Buildings were acquired, one way or another, right across the city of Budapest, and each was granted extraterritorial status under the protection of Switzerland. So there were little bits of Switzerland dotted across the map. Any idea how many, anybody? You won't believe it. There were 76 besides the glass house. They might be big, they might be small. Moshe Krause's workload in finding these properties, in making all of this work, must have been enormous, but he managed it. Two of the properties that were used, their special mention, apart from the glass house, 
the glasshouse backed onto the headquarters of the local football association, and Krauss managed to rent that, whereupon the Swiss turned it into Swiss territory. And Krauss managed to get access to, maybe ownership of it isn't clear, a disused textile mill, and the same happened there. Both were soon under the diplomatic protection of the Swiss embassy and filled up quickly with Jews. Moshe Krauss was everywhere, supervising everything while maintaining excellent contacts with Karl Lutz, making contacts abroad and raising money to keep things going. Once a Jew had a Schutzpasser, he was under Swiss protection and as a result exempt from the restrictions applying to Hungarian Jews. For example, he could go out for as long as he wanted during the day, while Jews without such protection could only be out for two hours a day. The final figure for those saved by these methods isn't known. No doubt because Moshe Krauss was at pains to keep as much information as possible to himself to avoid leaks and treachery. The minimum figure I said before is 40,000 because that was the approximate final figure of those covered by the much manipulated British Palestine immigration certificates in their final form. But there were many more who were under Swiss protection. When Karl Lutz was honoured by Yad Vashem, the figure of 62,000 was quoted. Many sources indicate the true, true figure, as I've already said, could well have been up to 100,000, maybe even more. The period during this operation was in full swing, was quite short. As I say, by October 1944, it had been stopped. In November, the Germans and their Hungarian allies resumed deportations of those not in one of the safe houses. 2,000 people a day were being forced onto death marches to the Austrian border and onwards in freezing conditions. Emergency steps were taken to try and save some of them. Kraus, Lutz and volunteers went out with blank Schutzpassen bearing forged signature <coughs> signatures looking for Jews to save. They would approach them, get their names, insert those names into blank Schutzpassen, which they would then hand over to the individual Jews. The Arrow Cross men had to release them. One of the most amazing stories was that of a young Jew named Pinchas Tibor Rosenbaum. This picture was taken some years later. In 2014, a film came out a very lurid thriller, very, very loosely based on his exploits, called Walking with the Enemy. I've not even <coughs> tried to watch it, it sounds like, yuck, you know. Anyway, his true story is amazing enough. He didn't, then at any rate, look Jewish. Somehow, nobody knows how, he got hold of an Arrow Cross uniform. He would arm himself with Schutzpassen, put on the uniform, forge Schutzpassen, put on the uniform, and go out into the streets looking for Jews needing protection. Nobody knows how many he saved in this way, except that there were a lot of them. He did this time and again, despite his inevitable fate if his Jewish identity was discovered. The Arrow Cross used to round up considerable numbers of Jews, men, women and children, march them to the banks of the River Danube, which runs through Budapest, and there shoot them so that their bodies fell forward into the water or were thrown into the water, alive or dead. Today, there are metal replicas... It'll come. Thank you. There are metal replica shoes on the bank of the river in Budapest to commemorate the victims. One day in December 1944, the Arrow Cross entered the glass house and ordered everybody out into the street to be marched off to the river Danube. It was bitterly cold. I mentioned the Arrow Cross liked to torment people as well as just taking them away and killing them. They kept them standing outside, standing, for two hours, men, women and children. They were doing it to be cruel. But it gave time for the Swiss to intervene. They were forced to return everyone to Swiss territory in the glass house. The Arrow Cross period didn't last long. Hungary was liberated by the Red Army in early in 1944. 
The war ended soon after that. Sorry about that. That's 1944 too often. 1945. At the end of the war, many of the people who had escaped the Holocaust in Hungary made their way to what was then Mandate Palestine. Many were intercepted by the British and put into detention camps and only arrived as a limb after the mandate had ended. Many of them were young, single men, and they fought in the War of Independence, including, I think, Moshe Kraus. I think he was wounded uh, in action. Anyway, he survived. A member were killed and wounded, but fighting for our state. I'm only going to mention one such young man by name, Moshe Shkebi. He was a sole survivor of his large family. His parents and all his brothers were murdered by the Germans. He broke out of a cattle truck and jumped from a train, taking the family, along with everybody else, to Auschwitz. He found his way to Budapest, where he was one of those housed in the glass house. And there he worked for Moshe Kraus on the production of documents. Later he married a Jewish girl who was a refugee from Egypt and they had children, <coughs> one of whom they named Eliezer. Eliezer grew up, joined the Israeli Air Force and became a fighter pilot. He shot down two enemy planes during the 1982 war with Le in Lebanon. He rose to become Major General Eliezer Shkedi and commanded... <coughs> Sorry and commanded the Israel Air Force from April 2004 to May 2009. Uh, eight, sorry, May 2008, and after that he became the CEO of El Al. This is Moshe Shkedi, photograph taken when he was commander of the Israeli Air Force. If you search for him on YouTube, you can see him and hear him speaking in Ibrit at the naming ceremony of Rachov Moshe Kraus on Pis in Pisgat Zev in Yerushalayim. That's the street sign that he was there to unveil, or someone was there to unveil, and that's him speaking at that unveiling, by which time he was, of course, a civilian. Back to the 1940s. In 1949, a group of survivors from Hungary and elsewhere set up a religious moshav called Mir Galim, which is outside Ashdod. They included some of the twins who had been the victims of Dr. Mengele's infamous experiments. They each knew the stories of the survival of the others, but they didn't talk to outsiders who hadn't shared their experience, a feature common to most of the survivors until relatively recently. Most survivors, the majority, the overwhelming majority, didn't talk to people outside their circle about what had happened to them. So that when at some point they did talk or were exposed, people said, you? Carl Lutz died in 1975 after receiving lots of honours. I think he was even nominated for the Nobel Peace Prize. But he, he never forgot Moshe Krauss. I only discovered this uh, a few days ago. <coughs> After World War II, when the Jewish agency told Lutz that he would be inducted into the Jewish National Fund's Golden Book of Honor and that a ceremony would be held to honor him, he thanked them but informed that it was Krauss who should receive the honor because without him the operation would never have commenced, let alone succeeded. As the ceremony neared, Lutz wrote to the JNF again asking him to recognize Krauss's contribution. But then, at a lavish ceremony, no one mentioned Krauss. Only Lutz praised him again and again in other places. Moshe Krauss had died at the age of 78, I believe, I believe, before Karl Lutz died, but I have no exact date. Before his death, he's said to have been honored by the Swiss government, but again, I have no details. In the 1990s, the survivors were elderly, mostly in their 80s, and they realized that their stories were going to be lost to history. So they set about documenting and recording them. In the year 2000, 
they established Beit HaEdut, which translates as House of Testimony. This is a museum now, which has its own collection of videotaped interviews with Hungarian survivors, some, some uh, just voice recordings, but most of them, I think, video interviews. It is quite independent of Yad Vashem. It is quite independent of the Spielberg collection, which itself contains 50,000 interviews with Shah survivors, and more now, I believe. By 2009, the museum was housed in a beautiful, purpose-built building in the heart of the Moshav. There it is, Beit Ha'idut, the exterior. The main objective of the building is to preserve these accounts of the survivors, but there are lots of items dating back to the events in which I've been speaking, as well as lots of items relating to individual survivors, some of whom were inhabitants of Beit Ha'idut, as they call it, the glass house. You can go and visit the museum. Indeed, I thought of organising a trip for members of the library. My wife and I certainly were fascinating during our visit. I ought to mention one more interesting sidelight on this whole topic. Again, I only came across it by accident a few days ago. It was a report that Raoul Wallenberg said at some stage before he was removed by the Red Army and ultimately met his end in Soviet Russia somewhere. That he'd, learnt, he'd learned much from Karl Lutz and Moshe Krauss and that he had based much of his activity on what they had done and how they had done it. No more information, no more details, just that simple statement is all I could find. If you have been, thank you for listening.